Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at regression and correlation methods. All right, so the idea of regression is that if I have two variables that are related to each other, and I know the value of one, can I make an inference about the value of the other? So think about temperature and ice cream sales. If the temperature goes up, what do I expect to happen on ice cream sales at the local you know, grocery store? Well, probably ice cream will go up in sales, right? Now, think about ice cream sales going up. Does that mean temperature goes up necessarily? No, no. Uh, so we always have to look at our models and make sure that things make sense. Now, if I knew what ice cream sales were gonna be tomorrow, could I predict the weather? Well, from a dad point of view, yes, but I know that the inference is not telling me like a causation aspect. So uh, remember that correlation does not mean causation. It's said so often in statistics, it's cliche, but ice cream sales is a good example of that. All right, so for regression, uh, what we're gonna do, we have two different variables that are related and what we want to do, we want to use, uh, you know, data to get an inference on how, you know, how are they related? How strong is the relationship? In this video, we're going to just look at simple linear regression. That is one predictor, one response, multiple regression analysis. In this situation, what we're doing is that we're interested in where I have multiple predictors uh, that give me information about a response variable. And something we're going to do, at least initially, is that we're going to assume that everything is like a straight line equation from college algebra. Why do we do that? Well, first of all, it's the simplest one to work with mathematically. It's the easiest for us. It's nice and simple. We grew up doing this kind of math in you know, middle school and high school. Uh, also, it works out a lot of complicated situations can be approximated by straight line mathematics. And so it ends up, even if it's not the perfect model, not the best possible model, frequently the linear regression models do a good job of, of letting us know what we actually want to know. All right, so here's an example. So here is my independent variable down here. And here is the birth weight, which is the response variable in this situation, and we see a bunch of dots. We have data and we, we, we plot it, you know, just like we would back in you know, middle school on the Cartesian XY plane. And then we look at it and we go, huh, it looks to me, to my eyes, that there is a kind of an increasing trend as the estrol amount goes up, it looks like birth weight also goes up. So let's go ahead and let's see if we can find a line that approximates all the dots. All right, so mathematicians have already figured out how to work out this line. It's gonna be called the uh, line of best fit. We're gonna minimize the vertical sum of squares difference between our point and the line. And that will be our regression line. All right, so here's just that raw data is giving us a look at what's going on. You know, in this format, I really can't see what's up, what's going on. Now, what this part is talking about here, this is our regression line. And this accounts for the difference between our line and our data. So when I look here, there is a vertical difference between this point and the line. I can see that there's a vertical difference. That that little E or epsilon thing, looking business, is just mathematically to account for the difference between the vertical difference between our point and our line. All right, so if I look here, if this was my line, if I had this original data, I can see it's a, it sits on a perfect line. There's no points that are bumped off a little bit. And so this is a perfect fit. Now here, I can see that the, the, the dots are not perfectly on the line. So it's an imperfect fit. So there's some variation, there's some deviation from 
uh, of our dots away from the line. And so here we don't have as good a fit of a model fit as we do here. All right, so we've got uh, just some three example scatter plots here. Here we see that my I have a positive slope for my regression line. So what this would be saying is that as estrol level goes up, we would expect birth weight to also go up. Here we have a negative slope. So we would say as age increases, we would expect heart rate pulse to decrease. And now here we have birthday and birth weight. So this is like day of the year from one to uh, 365. And we can see that really it's a flat line. Why is it flat? Well, this is a slope of zero. There's no relationship between birthday and birth weight. All right, so we are gonna fit our line by the method of least squares. So just to let you know, there are infinitely many ways that we could get a line down for our scatter plot. After I put down my scatter plot on the XY Cartesian plane, there are mathematically infinitely many ways that I could go through and find a reasonable line to approximate all those dots. Now, the one that we have landed on as like the benchmark method is called the method of least squares. What we're going to do is we're going to find the one unique line that minimizes the squared vertical difference between our dot and our line. And when I say squared difference, it's take the vertical difference, square it, add them all up. We want to minimize that sum of squared differences. All right, and so here, this is how we're representing it. So this D sub I is the vertical difference so going straight up, straight down vertical distance between our dot and our line, square it, add them all up. We want that to be as small as possible when we define our line. Why do we do that? Well, first and foremost, the math works out that we can do this pretty easily. It's, uh, you know, it's not too deep, you know, it's beyond the scope of this course, but it's not beyond the scope of this course by much. And so, you know, it, mathematically, it's a relatively easy thing to do. It has a uh, easy to interpret, understandable uh, approach to it. And it works out that a lot of like theoretical aspects for theoretical statistics, just it beautifully works out to give us very nice theoretical results. Therefore, we like it a lot. Now, this is different from like lasso or ridge regression or a GLM net. Those are other ways of fitting a line. Those are excellent ways. Uh, but they, it's a little bit harder to get the theoretical aspects out from those. Uh, the uh, method of least squares is very nice for uh, the theory approach. So we emphasize it the most. It's the one that's the most well-developed. All right, so here, this is the raw sum of squares of my X variable. It's the predictor variable. So I square each entry, then I add them all up. And so now it works out that sum of squares can be written in this equivalent manner. So if I take my individual X data points, subtract the X mean, square it, then add it up, it works out that it's equivalent to taking this entry, then subtracting the, uh, the, the sum of all the X values squared divided by N. So that could be like a shortcut for us to work this out. So frequently we were, we call this L sub X, X. All right. Now we can do the same thing with Y, easy peasy lemon squeezy, same idea, but instead of having X's, I have Y's in here. And we will denote this one, the sum of squared deviations from the mean L, Y, Y, because we have the Y variable in there. Now, another thing that we, are, that we will be interested in is when I go X minus X bar and multiply by Y minus Y bar for the same entry. So what, something that's important is that this X, I is on the same observation, the same person, same location, same level of measure, uh, level, uh, same unit of measurement, uh, same observation level as 
this one. And so this is going to be our measurement of covariance. This is going to be a very important one for us uh, uh, shortly. Well, it works out that if you sat down and did the pencil and paper mathematics, this summation is equal to this summation here. All right, so this is all of the x, y observations, multiply together, add them up, subtract the sum of the x's sum, times the sum of the y's divided by n. Okay, and so this is going to be important in measuring how strong of a relationship we have between the x and the y. You'll notice that if this is positive, then x is greater than x bar and y is greater than y bar, or x is less than x bar and y is less than y bar. So for us to have a positive number in, I'm talking about the individual sum in here, inside the summation, the individual add-in, for this product to be positive, both x and y have to be greater than their average, or they both have to be less than their average. And so that's that kind of leads us to the idea of using this to measure the relationship between our variables. Now, it works out that in simple linear regression, every single time, 100% of the time, guaranteed simple linear regression, the line will always pass through the point x bar, y bar. That is, that is a mathematical fact. And so if I have x bar, y bar, I, and I look at this equation here, I know that I could put instead of y, y bar. Instead of x, I could put x bar. And that equation is going to hold. OK. So what, why is that important to us? Because if I can figure out A, or I can figure out B, if I figure out one of them, I can plug in Y bar, X bar, and I'll be able to figure out the other one. Well, it works out that B is gonna be equal to L sub X, Y divided by L sub X, X. All right, so if I take this, in my numerator, I take this in the denominator. That gives me the slope of my simple linear regression. So one predictor, one response. All right, so that, that gives me an equation for B. Now I know what the B is. X bar, I know. Y bar, I know because it comes from my data. Now I can get the A. All right. And so this is the estimated regression line or just the regression line. All right, so that line gives us like our predicted average. So you'll hear me say this, we expect to have happen. Why do I say the word expect? Well, that's because it, it's our modeled average of what's going to happen for the Y value when I know the X value. So if I know the X value, I can get an estimate of, on average, what's going to happen to the y value. And that is what is denoted here. When I know the x value, and I've already worked out the slope and the intercept, I can get a modeled value for y, and that will be our, our modeled average of y when x is that given particular value. Now, this is just repeating what I said about X bar, Y bar. Remember, every single simple linear regression line falls on the point or passes through the point X bar, Y bar. And here's just a little bit of justification for that. All right, so there is a deviation almost surely and with real data there is going to be a deviation between our data point and our line of best fit. Okay, so one thing we want to know, we want to analyze this. Why do we want to analyze it? Because this is going to give us a measurement on whether we have a good model or a bad model. All right, so what we're going to do, I'm going to take my observed data, I'm going to subtract the modeled value, and that we're going to call a residual. All right, and this is the deviation of our data from our modeled value. And so this is the first step in evaluating, do I have a good model or is my model crap? 
before I launch it. I want to analyze this. Now, here, what's going on is that I have my model value and I'm subtracting y bar. I'm subtracting the average of y. All right, so if my slope was not a meaningful inference, so if, I, if I computed the slope and I got something that really wasn't important, then what would end up happening is the model value would be kind of close to y bar because the, the slope would not be of, 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 of substantial informative value. And so this is called the regression component of the point about the regression line. And this is how much does the model deviate from the average y value? So how much does the model deviate from a simpler model without using the predictor variable? All right, so the total sum of squares is gonna be y minus y bar squared, add them up. Now, the regression sum of squares is gonna be the deviation between the model and the sample average. So model value minus y bar, square it, add them all up. Now the residual sum of squares, this is the difference between our data and our model. So observe data minus our model, square it, add them all up. It works out mathematically. If you sit down and do the pencil and paper mathematics, which I have in my uh, regression models, uh, YouTube playlist, I actually work through the details of this. If you sit down and work through this whole thing, you will see that the regression sum of squares plus the residual sum of squares is equal to the total sum of squares. And that's what this is saying here. So the, the total sum of squares is equal to the regression sum of squares plus the uh, residual sum of squares. And this is how we can write it that way. One interpretation of this is that the deviation of y about from y bar can be broken down into two components. That is the deviation of the data from the model and the deviation of the model from y bar. All right, so now we want a more rigorous way to check to see, do I have a good model? And we want to invoke hypothesis testing. All right, so what we're gonna do, we're going to do an F test. All right, remember that the F test checks the ratio of variances. That's what the F test is for. And so what we want to do, we have uh, two measurements of variance going on at this point. I'm gonna take the ratio of them. If my F test, the F distribution, if that leads me to believe that they are different, then I have something going on. And let's go ahead and dig into this. All right, so we're gonna have our re residual sum of squares as and divided by the number of predictor variables. That is going to be like one of those variance measurements. And then we're, we're going to take the residual sum of squares and I'm gonna divide by N minus the number of predictor variables minus one. And that is gonna be another measurement of variance. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna take the, res, the ratio of these and we're gonna run an F test. And we're gonna call this ANOVA, analysis of variance. And we're, this, this is one way that we can conclude, do I have a good model, yes or no? All right, so here, my hypothesis test for this is that either the slope is equal to zero or it's not equal to zero. If it's equal to zero, then the slope is not giving me any information, which means that X variable does not provide informative value to the response variable. All right, so that means that I want a simpler model. I want to get rid of X when I analyze Y. Just like in real life, you want to get rid of your X, right? The math to appear for you. All right, so we'll take regression, uh, mean squares, 
divided by residual mean squares. And this is going to be, we're going to treat this as an F distribution with N and, sorry, 1 and N minus 2 degrees of freedom. And then we're going to run our test. All right, so if I get a large F statistic, that is it's far to the right, then I'm gonna reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. All right, so the alternative is that the slope is not equal to zero. So if I see a uh, that ratio is far to the right, that will lead me to the conclusion that the X variable has informative value of the Y variable variable. And here is the ANOVA table of how we compute this. And so here is all the entries worked out for us. Um, yeah, so this is from Minitab. Every single statistics platform will do this for us. All right, now there's also another measurement of goodness of fit which we'll call R squared. If R squared is equal to one, then perfectly all of our points are laying on top of our line. If that's happening in real life, you don't like, it's making, there's something causing it to happen. You, you'll, in real life, real statistical data won't have that going on. If R squared is equal to zero, then there's just absolute random noise. There's no relationship between X and Y. Now, R squared will always be between zero and one. The bigger R squared is, the more, or the greater the uh, correlation between X and Y. Close to one means strong correlation, close to zero means no correlation. You know, we can interpret this as accounting for how much how much variation in Y is accounted for by X? That's how some people like to talk about it. Now, equivalently, another way that we can go about this, instead of using the ANOVA table, instead of using uh, the F test, I can actually tackle this from another angle of using the T distribution. So we're gonna do a T test on the coefficient. All right, so ANOVA, what that does, that works to see, are my predictor variables, plural, are my predictor variables accounting for some of the variance in my response variable? So when we get into multiple linear regression, ANOVA, what we're gonna do, we're gonna use that to say, hey, do I have one or more informative predictor variables? Now we won't know which ones are informative, we won't know which ones are uh, useless, in our situation after we reach a conclusion on our test. Um, so down the road, ANOVA says, do I have one or more informative variables? When I if I had like 10, I might have two good ones. I might have five, I might have nine, I might have 10 good predictor variables. I don't know. The F distribution will tell us, do, do I have one or more good ones? The T test is about looking at individual particular predictor variables and analyzing does this individual predictor variable have informative value for my response variable? All right, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna have a null hypothesis that this particular predictor variable is not informative versus it is informative. And so we'll run a t-test on it. And if I get a t-test statistic that's far to the right or far to the left, then I conclude that the slope is not equal to zero and I have informative value. Now, an advantage of this is that I can also do a one-sided test if I wanted to. I could do uh, beta greater than zero, beta less than zero for alternatives. You know, either way, we have flexibility with this. There's advantages and disadvantages using uh, you know, using ANOVA and advantages and disadvantages with using the t-test. It depends on what you're interested in analyzing. All right, so here is if we want to do a one-sided test. 
All right. So I'm going to end the video here. Uh, take care and goodbye.